Okay? So, Tara Sonnenschein, thank you very much for being with us today at the Institute for Culture Diplomacy. It's an honor to be in dialogue with you, uh, in particular about cultural diplomacy, not only because of your experience uh, having served as Under Secretary of State for, for the U.S., uh, but really as someone who has actually been practicing cultural diplomacy, I would argue, throughout your career, uh, when you were Vice President of the United States Institute for Peace, as a journalist, beyond. So the first question I'd like to ask you uh, is a little bit of a follow-up question uh, to the discussion we just had. Uh, cultural diplomacy, on the one hand, is nothing new. Uh, you could argue it's been around since ancient times. Uh, really since, let's say, late 1800s, governments have really embraced this as a tool for public diplomacy. However, when it comes to academia, it's actually very new. Uh, in the sense, if you try to look for actually courses in cultural diplomacy, programs of cultural diplomacy, very difficult to find. As we discussed earlier, the Institute sees it as one of our main missions to really establish cultural diplomacy within academia. Uh, we started the first BA, MA, and PhD programs. From our point of view, this is very important. Uh, but I wanted to get your perspective in the sense for a long time, I think cultural diplomacy has been absent from academia. Do you see this as important? Uh, should this be a recognized academic field? Uh, if so, should it be around the world? Uh, and, and if that is the case, you know, how should it be done? Should this be part of our training for, for the Foreign Service? Should there be something in, in a broader sense that really should be taught in universities. How do you see cultural diplomacy fitting in to the academic world, so to speak? Well, firstly, let me say, Mark, that the reason I stayed an extra time in Berlin was to visit uh, the Institute because I am a cheerleader for cultural diplomacy. But culture is a, as we know, a freighted word. In my view, the time has come to move it from something heavy with baggage and for it to take its rightful place in academia, in public diplomacy, in society writ large. I think it has, its time has come where we can shed some of the cultural baggage that the word culture has had and agree that it is a bridge builder and that in order for it to be a central pillar of public diplomacy, it will need its own students, its own professionals. It will need practitioners who are studied in the art and science of cultural diplomacy. So I think it is important to underscore its value and its place and to be very concrete about what it can and cannot deliver. You mentioned cultural baggage. Uh, some would argue that cultural diplomacy also has a certain baggage. Uh, and when many think of cultural diplomacy, they think, you know, Cold War, CIA, this and that. Uh, so maybe just as a follow-up question, would you see any kind of baggage that cultural diplomacy as a field itself carries with it? Uh, you know, let's say as you move around or as you moved around as an American diplomat. And then secondly, if there is some sort of a baggage to cultural diplomacy, how can one overcome that? Uh, or, or how would you define, let's say, the cultural diplomacy of the future as opposed to maybe from the past? I would begin by reminding audiences, as I do, about the definition of the word culture, which as you know, and, and the Institute knows, is a word that means shared patterns and traditions. And it can mean individual patterns and traditions. And that there is nothing wrong with bringing your individual culture, tradition, identity, heritage, language to the table. That diplomacy is a word we use to combine individual strengths and engage in a process. So that means that cultural diplomacy is a process of sharing your individual traditions and patterns in a combined effort. And I think of it, I describe it to people as beef stew, or if you don't like beef, if you're tradition, soup, vegetable soup. In vegetable soup, there are potatoes and carrots and many things that have individual character. Combined, they, they make soup, very good tasting soup, we hope. We're not trying to lose the potatoes and the carrots, but we're also trying to create a combined set of ingredients. And I think that's positive. I think we can respect individual 
traits, identities, nationalism, cultural heritage, but I think we can be a greater force leveraged and combined where the sum is truly greater than its parts. Cool. I have many other questions for you, but I want to refrain to give my colleagues also a chance. Uh, maybe, did you want to? Okay, um, we spoke a little bit upstairs. Um, you, had met, you spoke about your dialogue with youth in Pakistan, um, and we also touched on the issue of funding, um, but we never really got to youth empowerment. So I want to first ask, um, what, what does that term mean to you, and how important is uh, political participation in creating youth empowerment? So we all know the world is getting younger. What a nice thought. We're not graying, we're getting younger. And by that we mean that, of course, the percentage of people under the age of 35 on our planet is increasing. That is just a fact. So anyone who doesn't believe in youth empowerment is kind of in denial of the fact that 9 billion people will occupy a planet, and many of them are young. So for our own self-interest, we have to be focused on young people. But there's something else to youth empowerment. It's three things. First, it's voice. Giving young people the opportunity to express themselves and to have the platforms that might come more naturally to established institutional leaders. As we would say, and as our colleagues say, share the mic. The second is not only voice, but a place at the table for policy making. Move over and let young people have a role in laying out the policies that will guide the planet, because they will one day be the leaders at the table. So youth empowerment is, again, in our self-interest if we would like leaders that are informed and empowered. And the third is a very concrete one, and that's employment. Young people need jobs. That means they need education, skills, training, and wage earning enterprises. If we do not provide that education, training, vocational capability, we are closing one set of doors. And the alternative, the alternative, I'm afraid, for young people with nothing and no hope is very dismal. It's a path toward radicalization, extremism, terrorism, violence, destruction, and all the things that no really right-minded individual would want. So again, it's in our interest to make sure that alternative scenarios, that there are paths for young people that lead to peace and prosperity. Thank you. Um, and just kind of a follow-up question. You touched upon the points of uh, young people participating in the political process. How do you see the nature of the relationship between young people and political leaders evolving? I think there are many new tracks opening for young people to be running right alongside the policymakers. I think of a group of G20 young leaders, so that when the G20 meets in the grown-up section, there's the equivalent of the kids' table, except they're not kids. They're young leaders. I think about the exchange programs where young people are participating in very much the same way that non-young people have exchanges. So in many ways, I think all of these grassroots efforts around empowering young people locally and nationally pay huge dividends later on. And I have a question uh, pertaining to multicultural communications. Uh, the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy works to organize several international conferences throughout the year, uh, just in order to bring people of diverse backgrounds together to have an intercultural dialogue. And how important do you think this kind of activity is in helping to build trust and uh, for people to gain understanding, as well as to discuss issues on a global scale? Any good corporate leader will tell you that corporations reach a diverse consumer 
face. What corporations globally have been slow to recognize is that you need diversity inside the decision-making process if you're going to seek to reach out to diverse audiences. So more and more we see women getting in the boardroom, minorities getting in the boardroom, those who are marginalized being spoken for. And the same is true for governments and institutions. Diversity of opinion, diversity of skills means simply you have more talent in the room. How can you have half the world locked out in the case of women and girls? How could you market to multiracial, multi-ethnic audiences if you're trapped, the people making the decisions are trapped in a certain mindset? So I think as we look for even concrete profitability, concrete monitoring and evaluation and measuring and results, we're going to see that a multiplicity of views and voices is a plus. Thank you. The issue of human rights can often be a controversial one. The Western conception of human rights can often clash with non-Western cultures' um, perception of what human rights are. So how important do you see the role of international law in assuring the development and implementation of human rights globally? And what role do you think cultural diplomacy could play in this regard? We are sitting at a table. And this table is very steady. So if I were to ask what is holding up this table, we would find some pillars, some solid material, keeping this table very secure. In my mind, rule of law is one of the pillars of a stable, sturdy civil society. I would argue that freedom of information holds up society. I think cultural diplomacy can take its place as one of the steadying forces. I think peaceful reconciliation of conflict is dependent upon rule of law. Because, you see, if I'm in my country and you're in your country, and we're both driving, and we happen to crash, I don't know who's at fault. I don't know who should pay damages. I need an independent, neutral body of law to tell me what my rights and responsibilities are at that intersection and yours. I need somebody who gave you a license and me a license. I need somebody to mitigate and negotiate fairly because I'm not going to be very neutral in that situation. I thought I was careful. You thought you were careful. We need a, a steady body of law to tell us how to proceed and to ensure that justice, or mercy, or a fine is paid. So I do think law matters. I think human rights matter. But we have to be respectful when we use freighted, loaded terms to be very clear about what we mean. What I mean by human rights is very easy. I mean the right of an individual to reach his or her God-given potential. It's, it's very clear to me that I believe we all have potential and we want to meet it. And I simply would like people to have the ability to exercise and reach their potential. But I will be respectful of what we mean by these terms, and I will be listening carefully to your definition. Thank you. Just as a follow-up question to that, when it comes to extremely controversial issues such as genital mutilation, where of course the West thinks that's an extreme violation of women's rights, but other cultures would consider that an important cultural tradition, do you think cultural diplomacy can play a role in that or are there means more effective? I think it's very simple 
although very complex, to ask a woman, is this the experience you would like? Is this something you asked for? Is it something you enjoy? Is it something you sought? I'd like to know that the individual wants to be married at 13. I would like to know that the individual would like to be raped en route to getting firewood for her home. I would like to know that things are not imposed upon individuals. And I want to be respectful of her choice. And I think I might know what the answer might be. As a follow-up, I'd love to ask you a question, too, maybe bringing together some of these topics, looking to the future, in terms of how culture diplomacy might look 20 years from now. In your talk earlier, you mentioned that we're living in a post-post environment, uh, post-Cold War, post-9-11, post-WikiLeaks, post-Arab Spring. Uh, and I think that's a very important point to make, in the sense that the models for culture diplomacy of the Cold War may not be appropriate today. Uh, we discussed human rights, which have been very absent from many culture diplomacies of the past, religion, etc. So my question to you, let's imagine 20 years from now, how do you see cultural diplomacy 20 years from now looking? Will it include these things, human rights or religion? Uh, in Europe, you're seeing beginnings of multilateral cultural diplomacy, things like Erasmus for the European Union. What will cultural diplomacy look like 20 years from now? I think it's going to have to be like a telescope that gets focused a little bit, because I think there is a tendency in new fields to have them be so wide-ranging that they're everything and nothing. So I think we're probably going to go through a period where we throw everything at it, and then there'll be a sorting out period where we say, now, now wait. It can't be all peace, conflict resolution. It can't be all art, museums. You know, I, I think there will be a growth period where we have a very wide umbrella, and then we say, okay, now what are the load stars? And I think we will have to break it out, and that by 20 years from now, it will have to be clear what things fall under cultural diplomacy and what things are best left to diplomatic negotiators or to a human rights group. So I think over the next two decades, we're going to have to work to define and refine the field so that people can grasp it more easily and help to delineate what we're talking about. Okay. Well, I look forward to continuing that process together with you. And uh, thank you very, very much for the honor of visiting us here at the Institutes and for engaging in this dialogue. Thank you all for the work you do. Thank you. Thank you.